On today's episode of The Resilience Project, I speak to Michelle Quay, who was hit by a car aged 11, which stopped her growth at just four foot four. This meant her formative years were spent feeling like she never fit in. She was an immigrant in a new country and only able to move around on sticks. After years of trials and tribulations, she beat the odds to complete the Inca Trail to Machu Picchu. Michelle shares incredible resilience lessons that she has used to help her achieve this, as well as becoming a highly respected author, speaker, and entrepreneur. Her insights into what she says to herself to help her turn her attitude around, even in the darkest of times, and the simple steps she takes to ensure every day can be a good day, will provide valuable lessons for people of any age and background. Welcome to this episode of The Resilience Project, chatting with Michelle Quay. So Michelle, you are an immigrant. You arrived in the United States without actually speaking English, with a permanent disability from an accident that happened when you were 11, which effectively stopped your your growth so you're four foot four moving around on sticks but here you are a successful business lady an entrepreneur an inspirational speaker and an acclaimed author you really have a resilient story that I think people can can learn from but if you don't mind would you mind just sharing a little bit about the accident and how you ended up with the disability so I was 11 when I had the accident and it was a day I would never forget. Um, even though parts of it, I actually don't recall because I was coming home, I was coming home from school one day and I was crossing the street. And I remember my mom was on the motorbike, motorbike coming to, to pick me up from the school. And I was trying to cross the street to meet her on the other side where I found myself listening to all these chaos around me and people were shouting, they were shouting, stop, stop, stop. But, but I was in the middle of the street. I did not remember how I got there, why I was there. And, and the next thing I knew, I woke up in the hospital. And from all the witnesses and how they describe uh, what happened to the accident was they found me in the middle of the street. There was a taxi that was coming towards me really fast. It must have ran a red light. And it was, by the time I got to the middle, it hit me and pushes me about a hundred feet away. So I lost conscious. I didn't know that someone had called the 911 or calling the emergency. I got rushed to the hospital and woke up. I remember just having this excruciating pain. Um, and I looked down from my waist all the way to my ankle. The doctor had wrapped me with the plaster, with the cast. And that was the last recollection I had with the accident. They basically said that um, we're going to send you home to recover. And for the, for the next three months, you'll be bat bound. You're not going to be able to move. And in order to stabilize your, your, your uh, lower extremity, the two, two, two legs, you're just going to have to stay home. From 11 to 15, I spent four years going in and out of the, out of the hospital. And they noticed that my bone was not healing. Somehow the accident hit and my bone just didn't grow. So I had a total of 13 surgeries altogether from age 11 to 15. And it was not, it was so painful. So that took away a good chunk of my, my life. After, after the recovery, um, basically I couldn't walk without, um, having the two crutches. And also my doctor said, in order for your bone to remain, um, a uh, growth, you, here's a pair of metal brace, wear this until your, you stop growth. And which is normally about 18 years or so. Um, so it was it was not something that I wanted to hear. I wanted to hear mm. that, oh, you're gonna be okay. You're gonna go home. You're gonna have a normal life. That was not something that I wanted to hear. Um, mm. So ever since then, I walk with crutches, four feet, four inches, and it's just not the same. Yeah. Life is yeah. just not the same. Those years of your teenage 
time where, you know, obviously teenagers aren't necessarily expecting to be bed bound and in and out of operating theatres. That must have been a, a huge test in itself on your 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 mental strength. I, I think the biggest struggle that I had was when I look around other um, girls at, at my same age, they're dressing up, they're dating boys, they're talking about boys, impressing others. And when I look at myself, I couldn't be part of that conversation. I was I was never part of, oh, that's let's go and put on about makeup, let's get our hair done, let's dress up in the most beautiful dresses and skirts. My outfit consists of long baggy t shirt mm -hmm. with long pants, or even if I were to wear skirts, no matter how hot it is, I would wear a, pan, a, a pair of pantyhose just to cover up my 13 scars on both of my legs mm -hmm. because they were so um, apparent and prominent that you couldn't possibly miss when you stare at me. And mm -hmm. people did staring at me and that made me really self-conscious about my image in front of the mirror. And it also made me conscious about who I am. And so what would you say, in hindsight, you learned about yourself from, from that period? I, I think throughout the journey, what I have learned is that it's never about you. It's always about the person who's looking at you, right? Mm. And, and I have not changed since 11. Uh, I'm maybe a little taller, like maybe 10 centimeter taller, <laughs> but <laughs> I have not changed uh, physically. So in the past, I have learned, I, I, I used to think that when people are looking at me, they're looking at me. But what I have learned is that when people are looking at me, they may be looking at out of curiosity. I wonder mm. what happened to her, or I wonder what type of story does she have, or what journey does she have to go through? I imagine that it would be so hard to be her. And so it's not a story about me anymore. It's a story about them, the, who they are and what they had to go through because what they're yeah. seeing me through, through their eyes is what they're seeing themselves. And yeah. it was a tough lesson for me to learn because in the past I took it very personal when people look at me or mm. I, I took it very defensively to answer their question, what happened to you? And mm. I remember one of the story that I often share is that there was, a, I was walking on the street one day and you know, I, um, in the past I was too proud. So I was struggling to balance myself, but I didn't want to use uh, crutches. And so I tried to walk um, by myself and, and it was, I looked like a wobbly penguin going down the street, marching down the street. And so it, it sparks a lot of curiosity from, from all these people around me, right? And then there was one woman on the opposite side of the street and she saw me passing, going down and she ran across the, the street and she tapped on my shoulder and she asked me, what's wrong with you? And that curiosity and the question and the way that she asked, it, it just, Hurt, right it's like shot across your heart and you're thinking yeah what what the heck is wrong with me mm -hmm. and so i took what she was saying to the heart to the really deepest core of who i am and i was wondering kept asking what is wrong with me but in reality it's really not about me she was just curious about what happened and the mm -hmm. way that she she said it it wasn't something that i i could just simply say you know what that's okay, just a stranger who's um, walking by, mm -hmm. and that's okay. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it was a really tough lesson to not take things personal, um, but rather see it as an opportunity to make that initial connection, right? It was, it was my opportunity to get to know this woman, and maybe she had gone through something, and maybe she had never seen something like this. It was mm -hmm. my opportunity to show her who mm -hmm. I am. Yeah, that's... that was a big, tough lesson. Yeah, but that, that is a, a great spin on that. And, you know, if I think specifically about disability, certainly when I was younger, if you saw somebody that had a disability, generally you were told, don't look, it's rude. Don't say anything, it's rude. Yeah. But I, I, I might be wrong. I feel like society has moved to a place now where actually 
why not talk to that person and find out and learn and 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 you know satisfy that curiosity and because it's a person you're talking to a person about their situation is that is that your experience now I, absolutely i think there's such a um hush hush it's a hush hush and this is how our our society, our culture, our family had taught us, right? If it's something that is not familiar or something that's different, hush, hush, don't talk about it because you mm -hmm. might hurt somebody else's feeling. But mm -hmm. you're not acknowledging the fact that it's another human being in front of you and that person has feeling and has a lot of similar experiences that you have gone through. So it's not how we say it. It's not what we say. It's how we say it. Right. I can come across being very empathetic, understanding if I were to just simply say, hey, I I'm just really curious about what happened. And, and you know, I, I would understand if you don't want to talk about it, but um, tell me your story. Mm -hmm. And so I started to ask people about their story, their journey, because it feels less offensive. It feels more connected. It feels mm -hmm. that I see you as part of me, regardless yeah. of your racial, uh, racial belief, your, your, your political belief, everything about you, how tall you are, how short you are. I see you because you are someone just like me. You're mm -hmm. human. Mm -hmm. And I think we forget that human aspects of, of ourselves and also with others mm -hmm. and every human being, no matter how we look, we all have feelings. So how about feelings come first? Understand using that empathy so that when you do say something, you're saying something out of that em empathetic way of connecting with someone. I'm, mm. I'm just curious. I'm not going to hide. I am curious and I'm going to ask, what happened? What's your story? Mm. Mm. And, and I know you know, from your book and from, you know, seeing some of your social media and stuff like that, you, you did have periods where you felt a kind of shame and uh, unworthiness, yeah. uh, which I know a lot of people, irrespective of whether they have uh, a, an obvious physical disability or whether it's um, uh, because of past failures or because of relationship breakdowns or issues with their family or a failure in business or whatever, they feel that too. So, how did you work around that? What can people learn from that? I think what really worked for me was having the understanding that our experiences are just experiences. They're not identity. And your identity of who you are, the foundation or the essence of that being will never change. Right. If you're if you do believe that, you know, all all humans are good, that fundamental belief is always going to be there. So what's going to change is our life experiences and our life experiences is just like the four seasons that we experience in life. We're going through spring, summer, fall and winter. And so these life experiences are not your identity. So in the past, when I was doing a lot of body shaming, when I was not having a lot of self-doubt and, and criticism about who I am, I was identifying to the experience in life that had happened to me rather than recognizing the fact that I am above of all these life experiences. Life is more than just this experience. So we're, we're this beautiful essence. And, and sometimes what comes up to my mind right now is the diamond, right? We're all the diamond buried in the ground. And in order to discover it, in order to find it, you're going to have to dig through this pile of dirt in order to find that rock. And when you first pick it up, it's just a rock. You have to just un, un, uh, clean it up, polish it, do a lot of pressure and, and to make it a diamond, to reveal the diamond. So your life experiences, think of it as these dirt that's surrounding that diamond. So mm -hmm. pressure that's putting onto this ugly stone will turn this stone into a beautiful diamond. You are diamond all along. So it's a matter of how you, how you choose to see what you want to see. Right? You can see yourself as the diamond, or you can see yourself as the pile of dirt that surrounded this diamond. With, how do you identify yourself? So I think that was my biggest aha moment of, oh, 
these are just life experiences that it's going to come, it's going to pass, just like the season. We go through all seasons, and it's going to be a, a rhythm of life that you experience, but your experience is not something that you identify to because not that's not what you that's not what you are. What you are is essentially this beautiful diamond, but you it's your job to discover it. I think that's a fantastic way of putting it. I <laughs> I'm reveling in hearing you talk about that. It's really great. And I think that 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 will transfer around many different types of listener here who who depending on what people are going through. I think it's a, a brilliant way of putting it. Um so you as a family left Taiwan when you were 15. So this is 4 years after your accident. I uh, you'd have had 13 or so operations by then. Um, and you hadn't effectively grown, bar maybe a couple of centimeters, in, you know, from that period. So you then arrive in a completely new country without being able to speak English. So that in itself, that sounds to me like you were kind of, you were piling up the things that you had to overcome there. You were piling up the fact that you may appear physically different to people. You were piling up the fact that you hadn't necessarily lived a normal teenage life. And now you're piling up on top of all of that, the fact that you're arriving as an immigrant into a, a country without being able to speak, speak their language. So how did, you, how did you move and navigate through that? I, I think I navigated through just thinking that this is all normal, like quote unquote normal part of our journey. I never gave it like a really um, deep thought until much, much later to look at and examine what my life means to me. As a kid, as someone who was going through that journey, I was going through my day. I just want to get my day through. I'm just going to show up. I'm going to do it and would worry about the rest of it later. So it wasn't a lot of, oh, I'm going to contemplate about how I'm going to go through, how I'm going to show up, how I'm going to overcome it. It became part of the norm to me. And I think my biggest inspiration was coming from my mom because she's very resilient. She's someone, she's a very strong woman. And, you know, imagine watching your child going through that accident and you spend your night sleeping next to her in a bunk bed or rolled out bed. And I never saw her shed a tear. And so watching her, how she live her life, how she show up, it be she became my, my inspiration of this is what life is. There's going to be a very tough day and you're just going to get up and you're going to do the best that you can to get through your day. And you're not going to cry. You're not going to shed a tear because this is how we do things. And so I grew up thinking that this is the normal way of living, right? You just show up, you just go through your day and you make it work. You're just going to make it work. That was great. But like you said, it was all piling up, right? So, mm -hmm. so oh, there's obstacles that's just piled it up, that show up, be strong. And so I grew up having this mindset of, I just need to be strong. I don't mm -hmm. care what's happening. I need to be strong. And so no matter how sad I was, how depressed I was, I need to show up and be strong. Mm -hmm. So I put up this persona of, I am just a strong woman and I'm going to not going to cry, despite the fact that I have gone through something that most people would probably just simply give up. Mm -hmm. But it was not me. I just showed up. And it was... Up until when I was 30, I had a huge um, breakdown. It was then I realized that for this whole entire years of my life, I was trying to be this strong person, but I'm not. I mm -hmm. like to have somebody to take care of me. I would like to cry. I would like to be vulnerable. I would like to admit that, no, I cannot do this one more day without somebody else's help. Mm -hmm. And it was that big aha moment for me to realize that sometimes when you are experiencing these obstacles and challenges, no, you don't have to be strong. And no, yes, you do. You can cry. It's okay to say, I need help. It's mm -hmm. okay to ask people, can you please help me? 
But I didn't grow up that way because my mom was such a great example of what strong women should look like,、mm. and I came to the belief that that's how my life should have been.、Mm. Yeah. But there are two really strong messages, and although they're kind of pulling in a slightly different direction, the "just show up" thing is incredibly inspirational. That is an incredibly、um, relevant. Way you know, kind of mindset for people that are、uh, procrastinating or you know not feeling like building their business or or getting on with their course or career or whatever it might be, uh, 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 yeah, or, or overcoming financial problems or or family problems, whatever it is, really relevant. But at the same time, pulling in the other direction is what you said from what you learned at thirty about. Sometimes it's okay to lean on someone else and to get some support and advice and、uh, you know tender loving care and 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 to cry and that and it's possible actually for those, both of those things to coexist, isn't it? Like it just depends where you are in your life, I guess. Yes, and I I truly believe that life is a balance. It's a balance between the yin and the yang, right? The positive and the negative,、um, the big and the small. We need a balance of everything in order to create this harmony. You cannot have the darkness without the light, and you cannot have the light without the darkness. So it's a balance of how we choose between the two options based on our circumstances at that moment. And there's nothing wrong with asking for help and finding your tribe, right? Which is a lot of what entrepreneurs need to do in order to go through a period of challenging times. So when you find yourself feeling alone and and you are completely lost, then perhaps it is time to think about who do I need to ask for help. And when you're going through some personal journey where you do need to show up, and just simply by picking up your key and just go and turn on your car. That takes resilience to show up and being able to、uh, be strong in order to do that. You have to be brave、mm. in order to pick up and just do that simple step, right?、Mm. But here's the key in choosing that balance. the The key is that you have a choice. You always have a choice of what you want to do, and never get stuck in no matter which circumstances that you're in. This is fascinating, and and one thing I think people are going to be astounded by is that we've heard the story of of、uh, your accident, the disability, the struggle walking, the 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 crutches, but then you went up Machu Picchu. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a it's by choice. <laughs> yeah, like I mean, there's easier things to do, like. How did、Absolutely. that come about? What a, I mean, incredible challenge and an incredible feat. Yeah. So it, it was by choice. It was definitely by a conscious choice that I chose Machu Picchu.、Um, and those, are,、uh, in case someone doesn't know where Machu Picchu is, <laughs> it's in Peru. It's in Cusco, and it's not inside the Cusco, but it's in、uh, nearby Cusco. And so I chose Machu Picchu because. It was around the time where I was trying to find my true identity, that essence of who I am, that diamond inside of me, right? And I was going through、uh, quite a bit of relationship、uh, challenge or obstacles, and and、uh, job or career、uh, obstacles. And I found myself in a place where I didn't see myself belong to anywhere. And one of the one of the easiest, the lowest hanging fruit for me to feel I belong was being part of my friends' conversation because they all went to Machu Picchu. It was a spiritual journey, really fascinated. They came home, they were all talking about it, and there I was. I was sitting on the sideline, listening to all these excitement, but I didn't I didn't have any way of participating in it because I'm just not physically capable of doing it. And when I caught myself thinking that oh I'm not physically capable of doing it, I'm like wait stop.、Um, what if what if I go? What if I prepare myself enough? I'm sure that they have they must have somebody with physical challenge like wanting to go. There has to be some resource around it, and that sparked my. Curiosity of wanting to do research on Machu Picchu and wanting to say, you know what? If they can do it, I want to do it too. 
And I went on this mission of searching for ways that I can get onto Machu Picchu. And I went on searching of how I can make myself feel connected to them, to their conversation, to be part of their, their everyday life. And so one of the things that they were doing, uh, my, all my friends were doing, they were uh, in, in fitness journey. They were like meal prepping and they're like buff and rib. And I'm like, I like to be that. So that was my first, first uh, sparks in, in that journey. I signed myself up for the very first time into a gym, hire myself a personal trainer. I said, you know what? I'm just going to get fit. I'm just going to lose my 10 pounds of weight and uh, just feel good about myself when I look myself into the mirror, you know, despite of the fact that, you know, how I look. So that was my first step, going to the gym, hire a personal trainer, and I started to be, be on diet and I was uh, doing meal prepping. So I started to have conversation about meal prepping. That was my, my biggest accomplishment, being part of that meal prepping conversation. So after that, I, I started to um, be a little more ambitious. I'm like, oh, I can meal prep. I can go go to the gym. I know how to work on the treadmill now. I know how to walk on treadmill. Great, checkbox, 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 right? All checked. Um, and then I thought about, well, Machu Picchu, maybe it could be something that I can do. So I went in one day to, and I spoke to my personal trainer. I said, hey, listen, um, his, name, his name is Joe. I said, Joe, listen, um, my friend came from Machu Picchu and it was so exciting. And I'm thinking, I need to go hike. And it's like, okay, Michelle, great, great goals. That, that's go hike. Where do you want to go hike? Uh, we have a little uh, Mount Wilson here nearby me. And do you want to go to Mount Wilson? I'm like, heck no, I'm going to go to Machu Picchu. <laughs> his, jaw, his jaws drop. He's like, Michelle. Machu Picchu, I thought you were talking about Mount Wilson. Just go hike there. I'm like, no, we're going to go to Machu Picchu and you're going to help me to get there. And so that whole year in 2020, uh, 2015, we start training and he had me uh, like on this workout schedule. He was doing cardio. He was doing condition. He was doing strength, strength training. He had me doing pull up and doing push up. Everything that you can possibly think of. I hike every weekend um, just to prepare myself to, to know how to hike. Bought myself uh, hiking shoes, the whole day pack, everything, all the gears ready. And by 2016, I booked myself a ticket, flew myself alone to Cusco, Machu Picchu. Yeah. <laughs> You, well, you can't leave us hanging there. We, you, <laughs> you get off the flight. And presumably you, you go with a group, like or once you get put in a group together. Yeah. So, so once I got there, um, I basically went there by myself. Um, it was my first time, very first time traveling by myself. In the past, I always traveled with family, traveled, brought my mom to Japan, everywhere. Um, it was my first time traveling alone. I had a little, little tiny carry-on luggage and I packed very light. And it was going to be a two, two week trip. So I packed a carry-on, I shuffle everything in there and I went by myself, but, um, there, there's high altitude syndrome that, that people experience going on mm. to the hike. So I was on medication, you know, two weeks before, and I acclimated to the high altitude two weeks before. And while I was there, I was so curious about a new foreign country. I didn't never, I would never have imagined myself being in a foreign place by myself alone, right? So I got so excited walk around with my two crutches in the entire town. And but back then I was really fit now. So I was able to walk around the town without any, any assistance. I was just there like having a blast. And two days before the hike, I came down with stomach flu. It was yeah. something, it was probably the ceviche that I ate in Peru that brought me to the, to the, um, to that local hospital. I was in, I was remember um, how I got there was the night before I got to the hospital was I was just having a lot of uh, symptoms and nauseating and things like that. So I called the front desk, um, mind you, I don't speak Spanish. Um, so I called the front desk. I said, you know, listen, I'm like not really feeling well. Um, I need someone to call the ambulance. So the ambulance came to the, to the hotel. 
pick me up, draw me and drop me off to the hospital, stay overnight. The doctor infused two liters of fluid to took and gave me some antivirals and anti-parasites. <laughs> so it was two days before the hike. That very same night when I checked into the hospital, I told the doctor, listen, I came to your country on a mission. I came to hike your Machu Picchu and I am not leaving here without hiking the Machu Picchu. <laughs> that same night, I called my sister. I said, hey, um, um, I, I got really sick. I have stomach flu and um, I'm in the hospital. And she screamed at me. She's like, you, you, why couldn't you book yourself a ticket to Paris and check yourself into a spa? Why do you have to do Machu Picchu? You need to get your butt home so that, so that you are safe. Like, what if you die out there? And I said, well, it's too late now. I'm, I'm here, <laughs> I'm here and I'm just going to go. I'll, I'll see, I'll see if I can make it. I, I, so I made a promise to her that if, if all things get worse, I promise her I will come home. But I was so determined to get out of the hospital, go on to that hike. And so the following, the following day, doctor signed the release and I was able to get, get back to the hotel, pack up my things and met up with all my uh, other group members. They were at this point, they were in Lima. They were in Lima coming into Cusco and I met up with them. It was, I knew that deep in my heart, this is something that was meant to be. I need, I needed to go onto this hike. So I met up, um, there was a total of 10 of us. Um, there's people from uh, England, from UK. There's people from Australia. Basically, every, everyone, every one of them were so amazing. And they were so warm and welcoming. We, we have this uh, nickname for our team. It's called Team Michelle. And I got a cake. <laughs> I got a cake on the last day after we uh, finished the hike. I got a cake from uh, one of the porter who used um, all the things that's left, and they made me a cake. And on the cake, it says Team Michelle. <laughs> that's fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> so they they they'd obviously embraced you, and I guess in some respects, you then felt part of you felt part of something, no? Yeah, I I I feel. It was, I, it was a big sense of belonging. It was mm -hmm. a big sense of belonging for me in terms of, I, I no longer see myself differently because they didn't see me differently. They were all traveling, we were all traveling the same and we all were camping out, ate the same food, felt the same thing. Everyone got stomach flu. And so it was part of a beautiful journey all along. And we we're just so, everyone was just so encouraging. And even on that trip, um, cause it took us four days to hike through the whole Inca trail. And on that trail, typically it would take about eight to 10 hours on a daily hike. So four days, eight to 10 hours, and you travel ascending up with all the stairs and hills. And then you come descending down with all the stairs that you have to uh, uh, climb through. And on that, on that journey, I remember there are times where, oh my gosh, you know, I couldn't do it anymore because at that point I was pushing down on my crutches on both of my wrists um, the whole entire time. So I was doing a lot of push up. I have good upper body because of that. <laughs> I was doing a lot of push up after push up for 10 straight hours. So my wrists were burning. I'm tired, I'm exhausted. I have trouble um, catching on my breath. I was getting tired easily because of the high altitude. But there's people who kept passing me by and my teammate keep passing me by and they will all turn around and give me a thumbs up. Keep it up. Cheers. Good job. And all of these words of encouragement was kind of my my uh, power bar. You know how we play games and you have the power bar. They were my power bar. Each time people turn around and gave me a thumbs up, they gave me extra power to say, you know what? I can do this. I'm going to get to there no matter how much, how long it takes me to get there. And so it was a sense of belonging. It was, it was also a sense of, you know, I'm in this, we're in this together. And yeah. so that was my biggest encouragement that I have received on that journey. Hmm. That's really interesting. I, I have a 
principle. I'm not saying I always carry it through, but I try and imagine that everyone I interact with, deal with, speak to, uh, even if it's just a, a single exchange in a cafe or restaurant or taxi or whatever else, is that I imagine that on someone's forehead, forehead there are the words, make me feel special, make me feel great. And, and that's like a, a reminder for me to try and leave that person better than I found them, even if it's only for a few seconds. And um, what it sounds like there, and, and I think that works across the spectrum, whether or not people have got physical disabilities and are or, or struggling or not, people want to feel good. They want to be acknowledged. They want to be noticed. Uh, but it's a really poignant point I think you share there that people doing that just gave you that boost. And of course, it would have made them feel good too. So actually, everybody wins from that. I think it's an important lesson people can take away. I just think that people need a smile every yeah. day. And, yeah. and I think one of the, one of the most uh, frequently comments that I get um, in real life or virtually is that, oh my gosh, you have a great smile. Sometimes mm. we're, we're, you just need to smile at the person, um, a complete stranger that you encounter, just give that person a smile. That would make that person's day so quickly before you can even imagine. Just smile, give people a smile. Who do you need to give smile to today? Right? Just go out and smile at that person. <laughs> not, not, not completely uh, in a weird way now, <laughs> but I, I think everybody deserves a smile. Just your smile is the best way of greeting a person and just saying hello. Right? Yes. And you don't even have to say anything, just smile. Yes, yes, completely agree. And, and you know, particularly, you know, I live in London, uh, and I'm sure you know if you, when you've been to big towns or cities, people are in a rush and they're, ugh, they look tense all the time. And I, I do try and do that without getting arrested. Like, you know, just if I, you know, just try and give someone like a positive facial. Uh, and sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes you see someone that looks stressed or angry or is starting by looking at you a bit strange and they crack in a positive way. And, and you know you've left them better than you found them. Um, and it's cost nothing to do. And it makes you feel better too. You, you, you talk about um, wearing people who wear an invisibility cloak. And I'm imagining that you came away from Machu Picchu not feeling like you had an invisibility cloak anymore. Yeah, I I think the invisibility in, invisibility came from the fact that we all carry a lot on our shoulder, right? No matter what you're going through in this stage of life, there's probably a lot of things that's troubling you or you're thinking about, you're worried about, and those becomes our invisible cloth. And you're wearing it every single day because um, one, you don't want to be judged. Number mm -hmm. two is you don't feel comfortable in sharing with complete strangers. And number three is sometimes it's just something that you feel you can just get over and deal with it yourself. And so we started to feel that no matter what, how you see me, you don't really see me. But in reality, that's not the case, right? That's not true. When I see you, I do see you and I understand what you're going through because it may not be the exact same thing, but there has to be some type of similar life experiences that I can connect and I can understand, I can empathize with you. And so that invisibility became non-existent because uh, that moment when I, when I enter Machu Picchu, the ruin, I walked through and everyone saw me coming through and they were all clapping and cheering. They were not just cheering for me because they saw me coming through. They were cheering for the fact that they too have accomplished a big part of their life journey. Mm -hmm. like who, who wakes up in the morning and says, you know what, today we're going to go and Machu, go, go hike Machu Picchu. Or today we're going to uh, give, it a, give, it a, give Machu Picchu a look. No, you, you probably, there's a reason why you're up there, whether you are curious about the site, whether you are inspired by, by someone else or in the story that you heard, you are up there for a reason. 
And so they're cheering for me, but at the same time, they're also cheering for themselves. And yeah. in that moment, I felt I don't feel invisible and that people actually understood me. So mm. I think it's the understanding that makes us visible. What do you say to yourself when you think of quitting or stopping or procrastinating? How do you push, push yourself back again? Um, I say to myself, let's have coffee first. <laughs> 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 Everything else can wait. Let's have coffee first. <laughs> and I said that because I'm, I'm such a uh, lover for coffee. I do love coffee. And especially now, nowadays, it's colder, getting colder. So nice, good to have a hot coffee. But that decision, it's always um, involved taking a pause, taking a time, time out, and to think about what is true and what is not. There's always going to be fear coming up in that, in that moment of decision making. Right. So take pause and take a stop, take a time out, think about what is not true and what is true. What are my strengths to keep going and what can I use from my experience from the past that will get me out of this situation here? And so I do a lot of reflection whenever I feel that self doubt comes in or something is challenging in front of me or something that I need to overcome. I take a moment of time out think about, okay, so what do I know is true? Hmm. And oftentimes when I ask that question, then I'm like, oh yeah, this is very similar. I can be creative. I can innovate. So even if I'm sure there's must be tall people around somewhere, right? On this planet of earth, go to another aisle and spot a person. That person looks tall. Hey, come over and I need you to reach me uh, the toilet paper on the top. <laughs> and so you always come up with this creative and innovative idea. If you just take a time out and ask yourself, what do I know from the past that would help me to overcome this challenge in front of me? Yeah, I, I'm really <laughs> glad you <laughs> first, but I'm really glad you answer that way because, you know, I think sometimes in the kind of hustle culture that is you know, perpetuated through social media and isn't necessarily real for most people, including people that are achievers and successful themselves. They, they sometimes forget what got them there. And sometimes the answer to that type of question will be kind of, yeah, you know, just, just get on with it. Just get on with it. You know, and you're right. It's not that like just taking a few moments to settle, relax, do something, have a coffee, a tea, something, whatever it is that makes you feel, chill, you know, get your chill back and ask yourself those kind of questions i think is a is a wonderful um answer and it it's very authentic uh and appreciate your authenticity there thank you um tell me when i i know something again that you i've seen you talk about online and and, and in your book is about um that kind of challenge that people have with the feel that of they have to be perfect because everything on social media that's flashing up is perfection and I'm not perfect. So, you know, <laughs> I'm not as good as that. Like, how do you, how do you navigate through that? I, I think perfect is very subjective. And I do think that every single one of us have a, have a definition for what is perfect. What does perfect mean to ourselves? Right. But so it may not look perfect to someone else, but it is always perfect to you. And so I think, being able to to acknowledge the fact that my perfectness it's not your perfectness and what you see is not what i see but i get to decide do i want to live your life or do i want to live my life for myself and so whether you see what is on the social media that's just none of your business <laughs> right it's not your business um so long as you can honor your own authenticity if i feel like oh you know what today i'm gonna do a video i'm not gonna have makeup i'm not gonna have the greatest script that i scripted out but i'm just gonna turn on the camera and just be who i am i'm going to talk to my people the way that i normally talk to them and that is just the perfect video that your audience needs to hear because you know like you said it's such a busy place on the social media that they don't need another perfectionist and perfection 
videos and that's all polished and it looks great, but that says nothing about who that person is. I, I bet you like a lot of these social media posts, when we see that actual person in life, you're going to feel there's a disconnection between who they are and who that uh, social media persona is. And that's not a great way to build your business. It's not a great way to build your company brand because people buy from people who are authentic, who are real. If I can, if I, I can buy something from a brand or a company where I feel connected to that person. I'm going to buy it from Steve Jobs because he looks real. He's not like all dressed up in ties and jeans and, and suits. He's just being Steve Jobs. Yeah. And that realness is um, it's rare nowadays yeah. in social media because everyone is trying to be everyone, but everyone has nothing to do with me. I... Yeah and real and I am just how I look, no makeup, broken English. And this is what you're going to get. What you see is what you get. And that surprisingly is actually the most effective way of building a brand. Yeah. Yeah. That's really true. It's interesting because there's this phrase uh, about never, you know, never meet your heroes because you might be disappointed. <laughs> But actually, maybe the, the, the spin on that is, no, meet your heroes and realize they're real people as well <laughs> that, that have real lives and real problems. And don't put people on such a pedestal that you think, oh, they're a film star or they're a celebrity or they're a sports star. So they must be amazing and everything goes right for them. It's not true. Yeah. I mean, everyone goes through their failures and disappointments and frustrations and, and you know, bad days when they don't feel like getting out of bed. Yeah. Have you had instances of, particularly since you've, you know, you, you released a book um, called Perfectly Normal, which is quite apt considering what we were just talking about. Perfectly Normal, an immigrant's story of making it in America. Uh, and it's for those people who are Googling it right now or looking it up on Amazon, they'll see you on the front cover looking perfectly normal, happy to be there, you showing up as you on your stick. Like, you know, that's absolutely perfectly normal. And you wrote that book, you, you know, I saw you had book sign-ins and I think your family were there and you must have, you must have felt a, a sense of accomplishment and they must have felt very, very proud. But do you ever have moments of kind of imposter syndrome and how do you get over those? All the time. Like even when I published the book, I was like, well, you know, it's great that you publish a book, but I don't, I don't think you deserve what you deserve. And there's every single moment after I publish a book, I still think that I don't deserve what I deserve. And there's a lot of inner critics that shows up saying the fact that, well, you know, um, it's, it is not the best sellers. It's still sitting on the Amazon and, you know, probably no one ever heard about you. And what makes you think that you have a story to tell? But the truth is my intention behind writing that book was never to become the Amazon bestseller. It was never to become the most popular celebrity. My true intention behind writing that book was I knew that I have this story to tell. I knew that somebody out there must be somewhat interested to hear from another person's story, right? And so that was my intention of writing that book. Did I accomplish that? Great. Checked, right? And, and sometimes we go into that imposter syndrome because there's so many things that we want to do and wanting to continue to do. They are so big that we don't realize that even the little tiny steps, these smaller wins is actually building up to that big accomplishment. Mm. So every time I hear that inner critic nowadays is that I hear you, I acknowledge you, I know that this is what you're telling me now, but you know what? I got bigger dream and I'm too busy to listen to you. <laughs> I'm just too busy to pay attention to you. So thank you very much. Stay in the backseat and I'll come back to you when I, when I, when I ask for your opinion. So mm -hmm. you kind of just acknowledge it. The fact that we all have these inner critics, we all have this, this voice, no matter how big of accomplishment that we make or how small it is, it's always going to be there. 
And it is the choice. And I, I, I think I talked about the choice earlier, right? So it is always a choice of what you choose to believe in. I can choose to believe in my inner critic and feel bad about, oh, it's a book, it's great, um, but I don't feel connected to it. Or I can choose, yes, I did publish a book, and it's right there, perfectly normal, and immigrants' stories of making it America. And you know what? Even if I just inspire one person in the audience, my mission has accomplished. And yeah. that's all I'm going to do. Bigger dream, bigger goal, go big or go home. Right. Yeah, so yeah. it's always an option to choose. And by the way, I have the inner critic sitting there. So my inner critic is an actual uh, baby doll, uh, a Barbie doll. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. And yeah. just, well, I, I, I like things like this. They are very practical. So you have a Barbie doll or something sitting behind you. Right, right there. And what, what, what purpose does that serve? How, how do you interact? So, so when we, when we uh, give our inner critic a persona, um, some, something external of ourselves, it becomes an identity that's separate from us, which means that we have a true identity um, that we hold. So that is not my true identity. My true identity is not this perfect looking Barbie who looks like she's gonna break any other day. My true identity is this Michelle who's full of wisdom, who has the knowledge to talk about what she needs to talk about. And so my true identity is this person and not that. So every time my inner critics show up, I will separate myself from that false identity versus this true identity of who I am. And that, that gives me more power to decide what, what, what I want to choose versus giving the power to this false identity you choose out of fear, out of scarcity, out of something else that you are never meant to be versus I can choose what supports me, what makes me big, what makes me feel powerful, what truly has my magic behind, behind everything that I do. Hmm. So that's the differentiation. That's fascinating. And I, I know that you help people overcome things like self-pity, which clearly it's, is something you could, have, you could have subscribed to. So how would you sum that up? I think self-pity is something that is needed. But again, you have the option, right? You have this powerful way of deciding who you want to be, how you want to show up, and when you want to show up. So while self-pity has this power in healing, in overcoming that, that period of vulnerability or feeling hurt, you can have a closed door pity party with anybody that you want to invite. Invite them, right? What, you can close the door to have a pity party, but at the end of the day, how much time do you want to spend feel pity about yourself, about the circumstances, or do you want to make a choice and get up and decide what would be supportive of yourself next time? Right. Um, one of the one of the very powerful questions that I ask myself all the time is what went well? What can I do better? And so instead of saying, oh, what went wrong? Ask yourself what went well and what can I do better next time? Mm -hmm. And that becomes that get me out of my pity moment, my pity party and think about, well, yes, the situation might suck and it might not be ideal, but this is what I have done well. So I'm gonna take what I've done well, my strength, and I'm going to make it better. So how can I make it better next time? Because uh, otherwise we, we learn from lessons and these are, these are circular events, right? So if you need to learn something, the universe will, will come back and throw it at you again because you need to learn the lesson. So until you learn what, um, what you've done well and what can you do better, the universe will just keep throwing the same challenge to you every single time until you learned it. So yeah. that's learn from that experience. What can I do better next time? And what do I need to learn from here? And that can get me, snap me out of the pity party right away. Fantastic advice, I think, for people that are perhaps spending too much time in pity rather than you know, turn, turning around from that, turning that around. But what would you say to people who 
perhaps haven't had physical the physical challenges that you've had to overcome, but are perhaps going through something right now, whether it's challenges with family, challenges at home in their you know marital life, challenges with getting their family to support them in their endeavors, their entrepreneurial ideas, whether it is even to get their first client or to actually feel like their their gig or their project is worth pursuing. And they're just not feeling it. They're just not, and they just don't know how to get themselves out of that funk. What would you say to people about how they can start to turn that around? I, I, I really think that number one is to acknowledge the fact that it is very challenging. Life is tough. And people who tell you, oh, you're going to get over this or, oh, it's, it's, things will get better. You probably don't believe it right now. And, and you don't have to believe it, right? Because life is hard, it is challenging, and what you're going through is real. It's a real experience, real challenge. There's no question, no doubt about that. But you get to decide how much time you want to spend in just knowing the fact that, oh, life sucks, life is challenging, life is difficult. You get to choose and decide how much time you need to get out of it. And when you do decide, then your next step is, what do you need to do? What do I need to learn from this lesson, from this experience? And what have I done in the past that would help me in this case, in this situation? So go back and look at your superpower, look at your strength, look at all the things you have done well. And I think one of the problem that a lot of people um, are experiencing, especially when they're facing challenge, is that they forget that all these years of life experiences that they have gone through, there's something, a skills, there's a talent, there's a strength that they have picked up along this journey that will just serve them so well if they simply remember to use that and use it, optimize it, um, to harness that superpower in that moment of time when they have self-doubt. And when yeah. you can think about when you're done feeling sorry, feeling having your pity party, when you're done with that and you're ready to take the next move, think yeah. about your strength. What can we use from your life experience to get you moving to the first step? It's not even a big giant step. It's just maybe like me, you know, just booking a uh, an appointment with a local gym and signing up to the gym. I, I wasn't hiking Machu Picchu overnight. I signed up to a gym. So what is that one tiny little step that you can take today yeah. that will get you feel better? Just do that one tiny little step. Don't take a big leap like everybody else telling you. Just take one tiny little step that will get you moving a little bit. That is where I would start. Great way of thinking about it. Now, what question did I not ask that you think I might have done and, and how would you answer it? I think one question I would add is, how do you choose bravery? How do you choose to be courageous, right? And the answer to that is you have to be quiet enough to listen to what your heart is whispering to you. So as you're sitting there, you may be having a lot of thoughts, you're deep in your thoughts, and maybe you need to make a decision, a very important one by the end of the day, but those are just noise, right? Those are noises that's distracting us and, and holding us back. So when you need that courage to make that courageous decisions, sit quietly and ask yourself, what has been my superpower? What has been working well for me? And remember your own superpower because that is what going to make you shine. Mm. Yeah, it's a great, great way of putting it. Final question. We've heard a lot of incredible stuff about how you've overcome challenges and the resilience that you have within you and, and what drives that. And I know that that can be spread into so many different walks of life. It's, it's been wonderful. But just in closing, what would you say about resilience that people need to hear? So 
resilient is not just being strong. It's not the fact that you can do and keep moving forward, doing what you want to do, right? Resilient is the ability to be able to fall and then get up. But oftentimes, people forget the falling part, and the falling part is where it, a lot of people find challenging. So in order to have resilience, you can't just show up being strong. You have to recognize the fact that you're going to need the time to get up and sh- and and work yourself up in order to be strong, right? So it's completely okay to feel pity about your falling apart and not getting up. It's completely okay to have that 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 negative aspects of who we are, but recognizing that that is not everything. That you have, you have what's available to you, and it's always going to be available to you. So it's a balance between getting up and falling down. Well, Michelle, it's been really fascinating hearing some of your life journey, some of your experiences, how you've overcome layer upon layer upon layer of challenges that would have brought many people uh, to a standstill, but you've still overcome them, become a accomplished businesswoman an entrepreneur, an inspirational speaker, uh, an author. And, uh, you know, I think it's just been fascinating. So really, really appreciate your your time. I'm pretty sure there'll be people on Amazon now looking at perfectly normal and, uh, you know, buying that themselves and uh, having a, a read to learn more about you. So thank you so much, Michelle, for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Thanks for listening to The Resilience Project. Make sure you're subscribed for notifications with your favorite podcast platform so you find out first when the next one is released. For other news and updates, you can register with me directly at weslinden.com forward slash podcast. Listener.